Okay, good. Um, my name is Michael Washburn, and I'm director of programs for an organization called Humanities New York, which is uh, a co-sponsor of tonight's event. I'm just going to say a little bit about Humanities New York, and then turn it over to, to the town. Um, Humanities New York is an independent nonprofit, but we're also the New York State affiliate of the National Endowment for Humanities. And we nationwide take as our goal to strengthen civil society and the bonds of community by using the humanities to foster engaged inquiry and dialogue about social and cultural concerns. I don't normally talk like that. That's our mission statement. And I said the word humanities a lot, which is kind of an opaque concept. Um, we at Humanities New York think of it less as a series of discrete academic disciplines, the humanities, like philosophy, art history, literature history. Less than that is um, sort of a set of tools for improving and engaging in civic life for cultivating critical thinking, learning how to attribute sincerity to people you think you may or may not disagree with, things like that. And the most basic of these tools is um, conversation. You know, that should be ubiquitous, but it's difficult to encourage. You know, open, frank, substantive dialogue about the hopes, anxieties, and obstacles that confront all of us. So Humanities New York is in the conversation business. And we do this in two ways. Um, we work throughout the state, a little more upstate than in the city. We divide our activities between grant making, we're a small foundation. Um, we give out modest size, but strategically important grant money to, to organizations around the state. And then we also host a series of direct service programs, uh, community conversations, reading discussion groups um, that are all sort of united, both our grant making and our direct service programs are united by our belief in the power of um, dialogue to foster empathy and understanding. Why are we here tonight? Well, we're real jazzed at the United States New York. So over the past nine or 10 months, we've been sort of slowly moving toward what's going to be one of our next major initiatives, which is going to be an exploration, a multifaceted exploration of New York State's prison ecosystem. And this is just, we've been having a lot of conversations with Jennifer, the Correctional Association, and some other folks, including Heather, who will be on stage um, in a little bit, trying to feel our way into this incredibly important, incredibly dynamic, but incredibly difficult terrain of conversation and discussion. Um, so that's where we're here tonight, while we're signing on, because we want to meet as many people as possible. Um, I'd like to thank Lee Stroll for being such a gracious host. And I'd like to thank the Correctional Association, and in particular, Jennifer Escape, for being so great with their partnership. Um, we left some flyers on the table up front if you want some propaganda. I'm happy to give you my card and tell you how to pick our pocket if you like. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to the meeting. Would you please join me in welcoming uh, the Correctional Association of New York's Jennifer State. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. Thank you so much to Humanities New York and to Lee Stroll for hosting us at this really beautiful venue and for sharing uh, part of this historical. Uh, precious community history with us. Um, we're, we're really grateful. Um, I also want to thank our moderator and panelists, whom we'll introduce in a moment, but particularly Heather Lynn Thompson, who's joined us um, during a particularly busy time for her and her family. And so thank you for coming and having this conversation with us. This week uh, marks the 48th anniversary of the uprising at Attica, but when you read Blood in the Water, do you feel a sense of timelessness? Partly because Thompson's writing conveys a sense of immediacy and intimacy, but also because so many of the issues that sparked the rebellion in 1971 continue to plague America's jails and prisons today. The Correctional Association of New York is celebrating its uh, 175th year of providing independent oversight to prisons in New York. We conduct monitoring visits to 54 prisons across the state, and we receive hundreds of pieces of mail each month from people inside who provide their own vivid account of the experience of incarceration today. One letter we received recently was addressed to Bill Snipes, our moderator, uh, who joined us on a recent monitoring visit to Elmira Correctional Facility in August. And the author of this letter writes, I truly enjoyed talking to, to you today because it's been quite a while since I've talked to someone who looks like me. Here in state prison alone, I don't have family or friends support, and it's truly hard for me. Most of the time, I really think of killing myself because it's really that bad. 
I really feel like I hit rock bottom. But today, after talking to you and looking into your eyes, you showed me that you really care, and it really sparked something in me. And when you walked away from my cell, I told myself I could make it. Tonight, we look forward to discussing the history of Attica, uh, tracing its impact to the current social movements aimed at undoing mass incarceration, and using lessons from Attica to look into the future of prison reform. I should take this opportunity to plug an event on this very topic, the future of prison reform, next week, which has been organized by two organizations that I admire deeply, the Release Aging People in Prison Campaign and the Sentencing Project. And they're holding two events next Wednesday, the 16th, I believe, and there are flyers out. Please take them in and engage that way. And there are some rap members in the room tonight who can help direct you to that information. If you'll refer to your program briefly, which, by the way, doubles as a bookmark, so uh, you can use it again as you're reading Blood and Water later. Uh, you'll notice that we structured the conversation into three segments, and I realize we're a little bit behind, but we're going to start with the past, then the present, and then the future. And after each segment, we're going to open up the conversation to invite audience participation in question, question and, and discussion. And then at the conclusion of the program, we'll offer uh, copies of Blood and Water for sale. Some of you, I think, have already purchased some, and Heather's agreed to sign them. And the suggested donation for the book is $20. One note, we, were, we are filming the event. And so during the question and answer period, you do not wish to be uh, on camera, but you want to pose a question, just flag me or Michael, who we started out. Uh, down and, and then we can take your question and, and read it back to the panel. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator who is a friend of criminal justice reform and of the Correctional Association, Bill Snipe. Bill Snipe is a senior litigation partner at Sullivan and Cromwell where he represents clients in complex litigation in securities, banking, intellectual property, and other matters. Bill has represented the world's largest oil and gas company in antitrust litigation, the largest spirits manufacturer in youth marketing litigation, and a large U.S. law firm in litigation seeking to hold lawyers responsible for suppressing information about the hazards of cigarette smoking. Bill has received numerous awards for public service, for advancing diversity in the legal profession, and for a groundbreaking initiative he founded on bridging the social and economic gap between young black men and their peers. The American lawyer called him a lawyer statesman and his initiative unprecedented, observing that historically Wall Street law firms and investment banks have spent little time trying to address the root causes of African American poverty. <coughs> we are privileged to have Bill here to guide us through this important discussion this evening. Uh, four days, years ago, 1,300 prisoners of the Anderson Correctional Facility rebelled against horrendous conditions, brutality, and racism. They took over the prison and they took 42 oh, hostages. Here, did you, oh, yes, sorry. The state negotiated for four days, then sent in heavily armed guards and troopers to the the prison by force. When the dust settled, 39 people were dead, hundreds more were injured, and the fact-finding commission called it one of the bloodiest days of encounters between Americans since the Civil War. In the aftermath, state officials justified the retaking by false tales of inmate brutality. <laughs> Commissions were formed, investigations, indictments were handed out, and so followed decades of attempts by the state to suppress the truth about what happened that after. And then along comes, comes Heather Thompson and her book. The first comprehensive look at Attica and the first unveiling of the truth. So it's right that we should start this program with uh, Heather telling us uh, what happened at Attica. But before we turn to Heather, let me introduce the panelists who will talk about Attica and its aftermath. Um, Mr. Uh, Jose Salzone is the director of RAP, the Release Aging People in Prison campaign, which works to end mass incarceration through the release of older Americans from prison and the reduction of long-term sentences. Uh, RAP is a grassroots group campaign that was started by formerly incarcerated people 
Uh, Mr. Salzone, after spending 38 years in prison, was released in January 2018 and has dedicated his life uh, to advocating for criminal justice reform. Marcus King is an independent consultant, formerly the executive director of the New York City Board of Correction, which is the oldest independent jail oversight agency in the country. Under her leadership, New York jails moved to the forefront of transparency by releasing dozens of reports on jail conditions, on violence, on visitation, on grievances, on Medicare, medical care, on solitary confinement. Um, as a criminal justice policy advisor at City Hall, she also managed the task force that developed plans to ensure that people with behavioral problems get help and not help in doses of criminal justice. Tyrell Mohammed is the monitoring associate for the Correctional Association of New York. He is also a founding member of RAP and a founding member of the New York chapter of the Campaign for Alternative Site Safe Confinement, which is a national effort to reduce the excessive use of solitary confinement. Uh, Mohammed works to improve the very prison conditions he endured for nearly 27 years, including seven years of solitary confinement. Uh, so with that, I give you um, a talk. Good evening. Thank you so, so much for having me here this evening, and I, I really do need to start with some very heartfelt thanks to people, um, especially to Weeksville Heritage Center to have us here tonight. This place is incredible, and I encourage you all, if you've not seen it, to come back and see the extraordinary houses in the back, which is the site of uh, one of the oldest free black settlements in New York, and really a must-see. So thank you to everyone for having us here, and thank you also to the Correctional Association uh, everyone should know that even when doing this book on Attica, the Correctional Association's fingerprints were all over it in terms of constantly showing up at Attica to shine the light on what was going on there. Uh, but also, uh, thank you to Humanity to New York for starting these really essential conversations. Um, and a really heartfelt thank you for the panelists that I'm sharing this evening with. Um, Tyrell and I have had the opportunity to talk about Attica together thrilled to be here with you again, and also Jose and Martha, who is obviously has much to contribute to this as well. So thank you all, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I am going to start today, this is going to be a whirlwind overview of what happened at Attica uh, today, 48 years ago today. Actually, today is the second day of the uprising 48 years ago. And I just want to begin by saying that um, I'm really here as the messenger, the, 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 the spokesperson, the conduit through which the story will be told. In fact, there are so many of you sitting here tonight that could tell this story, that this is your story. Uh, some of you were there. Some of you fought this fight in the moment and are still fighting this fight in the justice system. And so I am deeply beholden to all of your stories to even be able to be here tonight and tell you uh, the story that I'm going to tell you. Um, I want to just start, though, by just reminding us of why we should know anything about Attica. There's so many reasons, not the least of which this was uh, an extraordinary human rights struggle. It's an extraordinary story of state murder and one that we need to reckon with. But it is also a story that really helps us to make sense of where we are today, and that is something we absolutely have to do. If we don't have any historical context, we tend to proceed blindly in terms of what we need to do next, and God knows we need to do something next. Uh, and that's because where we are today is in the world's most uh, brutal, <laughs> Uh, really horrific criminal justice system, one that is larger than any other on the planet, one that is more racialized than any other on the planet. I just share with you this one slide, which is comparing the racialized incarceration rate of this country with South Africa at the height of apartheid. Mm -hmm. Just to give you a real sense of what an outlier we are and how horrific and brutal the system is. It's important we reckon with this because not only is it barbaric, but it's also important, I'm the historian here, so I get to say this, 
We didn't have to do this. There's so many reasons why we didn't have to do this, but the, not the least of which we didn't have to do this because despite everything that we were told at the time, we were not in the middle of the most horrific crime wave of all time. In fact, I just want to share with you this quick graph to show you that if you just go straight to homicide, for example, uh, the murder rate had not been that low when we started the current crime since the 19-teens. We did this for political reasons. We did this as a policy choice. We did this as a response to the civil rights movement. We did this as a response to the black freedom struggle. And for all of those reasons, we need to rethink what it is that we did. Attica is at the core piece of this, what did we do? If you look at this graph, when the prison rate goes through the roof, if you could zero in a little bit more, you would see that, yeah, you know, we had never had a great track record with prisons. They were always racist. They were always too many people behind bars for too many reasons. But after 1972 is when it really goes through the roof. And so as a historian, that was something that I felt that we really had an obligation as a society to explain. And Attica, it turns out, for all kinds of really complicated reasons, is at ground zero of that. And it's because of the lies told about Attica and at Attica that had a lot to do with why we got this story so wrong, took a turn so wrong, and ended up where we are. So I think it's time to resurrect what really happened at Attica and tell the story of the people who were there. This is the story. It all came together in this book called Blood and Water. Um, again, a story that could not have been told were it not for the incredible survivor stories. People share their stories with me. Let me tell them uh, this is really their story. It's a story that took 13 years to tell. And I, I mention that because it's really important to know why didn't we know more as a general public about Attica? It's because there was a cover-up at Attica. We weren't supposed to know. There was a, a deliberate effort to make sure that everyone didn't know, and you should all know that the records of Attica are still sealed. We still can't get at the full story of what happened at Attica, and I would not have been able to tell it were it not for the survivors, and also through a complete happenstance of finding a cache of records that actually allowed me to name the police shooters after 40 years. So that's why we didn't know. But what is it we need to know? Well, this is Attica, and I know many in the room have been to Attica, either monitoring it or living inside of it or struggling against it. This is Attica. It's in upstate New York. It's a sprawling complex. It is huge, and it looks today exactly as it looked when it was built during the Great Depression. It still has the same locking mechanisms. It still, to this day, has the bullet holes up on the catwalks from the day that the police stormed Attica. And in this place in 1970, let's just start at the beginning of that moment that Attica really starts to rumble. You've got a whole lot of men in there, a whole lot of men, way too many men. It is overcrowded, overwhelmingly from places like Brooklyn, who are in this place, and this place is a hellhole. This is men are being fed on 63 cents a day. Men can't get parole because the rules are so screwed up. Men can't see their children if they're not married to the mother of their children. Their mail is censored. If you speak Spanish in this prison, you're constantly ending up in heat walk because there's not a single guard in this place that speaks Spanish. There's not a single guard of color in this place. And who are the guards? The guards are white kids from upstate New York. And this is their job. This is the only job. And the one thing, though, that these two groups, groups can agree on is that this place is in bad shape. The guards are trying to get their union to do something. The men inside are trying to get the correctional officials to do something. They're writing letters. They're writing letters to state senators. They're writing letters to say, do something. And nobody does anything. I just want to snapshot, right? This is today. This is like this is this is a moment today where how many letters to go to the correctional associate do something, right? Nobody's even saying take me home. They just do something, right? Nobody does anything. So on September 9th, again, 48 years ago this week, the men inside take over Attica. It's a complicated story as to why and when, and it's a really amazing story that's linked with activism in California. It's linked to the murder of George Jackson. It's linked to all kinds of really interesting things that I invite you to read in the book. 
But at the end of the day, this is an extraordinary rebellion. Nearly 1,300 men stand together. They come out into one yard, D yard. They set up a medical tent. They set up um, a food distribution tent. They set up a negotiating table. They elect representatives to speak for them out of each of the cell blocks at Attica. And thus begins an extraordinary human rights uprising for basic human rights in this facility. This is negotiations that go on for four long days and four long nights. And in the book, you were there for every single second of it. And this is a negotiation that brings in observers to make sure that the state knows, uh, negotiates in good faith. You'll see up there, for example, on the left, Clarence Jones of the Amsterdam News and Bill Kunstler, famous lawyer from New York, and there's Tom Wicker from the New York Times. And that's just a sampling. And there's so many important people. They're black assemblymen from Buffalo. Everyone is on the scene to make sure that this negotiation nets something productive. And you can see the negotiation. There is the Commissioner of Correction sitting right at the negotiating table in D yard. And the thing about this negotiation is everybody there knew it was essential that it continue. It was becoming productive. It was netting really important things. And why did that matter? Because for those same four days and four nights outside of this facility, every single state trooper battalion in New York descended on Attica. Off-duty corrections officers descended on Attica. And for those same four days and four nights, these guys are outside and they haven't slept. And they are being fed rumors and innuendo about all kinds of atrocities going on inside by the FBI, who, by the way, is sending teletypes all the way up to the White House, the president, the vice president, the CIA, the Marines, the Navy, you name it, right? Everyone's eyes are on this. And they want in and they want revenge. So it is essential that these negotiations continue. But the problem is there's one guy standing between this and peaceful settlement, and that is the governor of New York, Nelson Rockefeller. And he has no intention of settling this. One of the things that the book, uh, one of the things I was able to find for the book was the absolute proof that they never had any intention of settling this peacefully, that they had no intention of alerting the men to the inside that there was going to be an assault, that people were going to die. And that Rockefeller was not going to give in because he wanted to be the President of the United States. And the only way to do that, with Nixon in the White House, was to show that you were never going to give in to people behind bars. And he begs, the observers beg him, you've got to come to Attica. This is their statement. And they are clear. Look at the language. They are clear. If you don't come in here, there's going to be a massacre. Because they can see outside what's happening. They can see the guns. By the way, the guns that are being passed out like candy. Nobody's writing down serial numbers. Nobody is saying whose gun is whose. And everyone's loading up with their own guns, their personal guns, their, their hunting rifles. There's ammunition on the scene outlawed by the Geneva Convention. Hollow tip bullets, you name it. And that's why it is essential there's going to be negotiations continuing. But he says no. Negotiations are over. And the one main sticking point is amnesty. He's not going to get amnesty for the men inside for the Attica brothers having dared to rebel. And so at the end of the day, they're going to go in one way or the other. But they don't tell anybody that. And on that fifth morning, the guys inside on that Horrible, cold, rainy September morning at State New York think that negotiations are still in play. They're made to think that negotiations are still in play. I found the document that said in big letters, do not give an ultimatum. They don't want them to know who's coming in. And so they think negotiations are put. And then all of a sudden, the helicopter comes over. They can hear it. And you know, to, to, to one of those heartbreaking scenes is that People actually have enough faith that someone's going to do something that a kind of cheer goes up because they think that maybe Rockefeller's actually coming to at least stand by their ability to surrender peacefully. But then the helicopter leaves and they realize it's a reconnaissance helicopter and that 
this is not good. And then panic sets in. And a plan gets put into place that had been discussed. And the plan was basically this. That if they are look like they're, they're going to come in, like that we can't stop them coming in, let's take some of the hostages, because there were hostages. By the way, hostages, guards who had been, civilians who had been surrounded, protected, fed, taken care of, Let's bring them up on the catwalk because let's make sure that they know. If you're going to come in, you're going to kill your own. Like, if you don't care about us, do you even care about your own state employees? So they bring them up there. And in the book, you are up there on the catwalk. I mean, you are up there. These men are shaking. They are terrified. Because at this moment, nobody even really has any faith that they care enough about their own state employees. It's really what's at stake is showing the men inside. Who's boss? And so on that fifth morning, just as everyone is up on that catwalk, another helicopter comes over. And that helicopter dumps canisters of CN and CS gas all over the yard. And it's a bit of a misnomer, because when you say tear gas, you're kind of thinking gas, but it's not really gas. It's a powder. And it gets in people's eyes and down their throat and in, in, in all of their mucous membranes. And when this gas comes over, it mows everybody down. They are vomiting. They are retching. They're on the ground. And at that moment, when they're on the ground, over 300 state troopers come in shooting. Shooting every weapon that they have. And within 15 minutes, to the sound of a helicopter circling overhead saying, surrender with your hands up and you won't be harmed, surrender with your hands up and you won't be harmed, all you can hear on the video, because guess what? They were filming everything. All you can hear to that is And needless to say, it is carnage. But here's the key as I wrap this up. That's not what the American people knew. That's what everyone inside knew. That's what the family members knew. That's what anyone who had come since knew. But that's not what America knew. And there's a reason. Because in that moment, state officials stood outside Attica, and they said that something totally different had happened. The prisoners had slit the throats of the hostages. That's how the hostages had died, they said. Worse, they had actually castrated one. They had actually stuffed his testicles in his own mouth. And the media is like, what? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Yeah, we can corroborate it. We saw it with our own eyes. We actually have film of it. And that story went out on the front page of the New York Times. It went out on the front page of the LA Times. And here's what's really significant. It went out on the front page of every small town newspaper in America because it went out on the AP. And it was a bald-faced lie. Prisoners killed the hostages. They were barbarians. They were barbarians. And all of a sudden, this nation, which, by the way, had been polled, was against the death penalty, was against uh, no, no basic civil rights in prison. All of a sudden, you start hearing death penalty, longer sentences, mandatory minimums. Nationally, Attica becomes the rallying cry for the right to start doubling down on the war on crime in a way that it had. Now, of course, meanwhile, all kinds of really important improvements come out of Attica because of the suffering and the struggle of the men inside. And we've got people here tonight that can talk about that. But nationally, the backlash was brutal. What America didn't hear was what was going on inside. America's turning on prisoners left and right, but inside, these same men are just flat out being tortured. They are tortured for days. They are tortured for weeks. Doctors are trying to get in. They are being turned away. Lawyers are banging on the door trying to get in to protect people's basic rights. And I don't have time to get into it today, but I hope you will read the book because what happens afterwards is one of the most incredible legal struggles in American history. Because lawyers do show up at Attica and they make sure that everybody inside ultimately has a lawyer. And it is a David and Goliath struggle like you've never seen before to hold the state of New York accountable. But in this moment, right, 
prisons are closed spaces, even though the, the public pays for them. And this is what was going on behind closed doors. I don't have time to get into it, but the hostages families also, they're getting swindled, they're getting ripped off. They're being left with a pack of lies about what happened to their husbands and brothers and sons and daughters. There's investigations. The whole book is going to walk you through those investigations. There's a citizen's investigation. There's congressional investigations. But guess what? None of them could actually tell what happened because what I now know is that from the minute this thing jumped off, the Rockefeller administration is sitting in Rockefeller's fancy schmancy estate in Buckingham Code Hills, and they're getting their story straight. Three weekends in a row, secret meetings that get it straight. Who's there? Head of the state police. Who's there? Attorney General. Who's there? Rockefeller's men. And so there's an investigation into Attica, but the thing of it was that there was photographs that had been doctored, there was film that had been spliced, and despite all that, men are indicted. That's why the lawyers have to show up. Oh, by the way, so, so, so everyone in this country here is, first of all, that prisoners have castrated people and murdered them, and then they watch the news for the next couple of years and watch only prisoners being indicted, right? But that's not the end of the Attica story, and that's where I'm going to leave it. The Attica story is about horrific repression, and it's why we need to stop and honor what happened there and the sacrifice and struggle of the men inside and the brutality inside. But at the end of the day, nobody shut up, sat down, gave up, the whole last part of the book takes you through the struggle to be heard, the struggle to hold the new state of New York accountable. It's a complicated story. It has many factors, many layers, many people. But it does remind us that the premise that started the Attica Rebellion was the fundamental premise that people behind bars are human beings. And they will always fight to be treated as human beings. And no matter what the state of New York did, that remained true. It remains true today. It's why all of us are here today. It's why the system needs to change. And it's also, at the end of the day, why Attica matters still now. Thank you. So let's, let's turn to this last point. I think we wrap up, Heather. And that's why Attica happened. And I'd like to uh, you to think about that, but start with uh, with uh, Tyrell Mohammed. Uh, you, you were a decade later, you were at Attica and you were with uh, uh, riots. Um, in the context of helping us understand why Attica uh, happened, tell us about, about your experience and why it's here. Oh, Professor Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, it was right around 1982. I was um, around 22, 23 years old, and I was in Attica. And at the time, uh, a law firm or a law organization called the Prisoners Legal Service had did um, a report on Attica 10 years later. And the men inside wanted a copy of the report to see if the conditions were still the same and, and what have you, and we were denied it. And once we were denied, um, the population got real angsty. Now, when you're in a riot, it's a free-for-all. Everything's moving fast. You don't know friend or foe. Believe me, you're going to have serious anxiety. But at this time, the riot wasn't just between the prison population. It was between the prison population and the staff. Because at that time, 10 years later, the conditions were still the same. Men were being beaded up in the hallway, they got a place called Times Square. And in Times Square, you know, you can't talk, you have to be quiet, and just not talking can cause you to get killed. At this time in Attica, the guards were so brutal, and you gotta remember, these are generations of families. So I was there doing the second generation, uh, and those guards that were there, their family members had already participated in the murder and they gotten away with it. So the attitudes at this particular time is that we can do this again and we will do it again. Matter of fact, they had a model when you came to the Attica prison. This is our jail and you will never take it again. 
and you get your ass whipped. They always identify somebody and act as an example to beat in front of the other men so the other men could be fearful and coward. This is prison, this is Attica, 10 years after the riot. The conditions didn't change. The men were still being oppressed to the point where as, as a young man, 23 years old, the older men at that time were there, they were Black Panthers, civil rights um, leaders, um, revolutionaries, and the mindset then was resistance because these are men who were resisting on the outside. And I was a young man, you know, very impressionable to see people under these conditions standing up against some real awesome odds. You don't stand up in prison and think you're gonna win. Really, you know you're making a major sacrifice. You're making the sacrifice of your life, but you do so when depression becomes unbearable. I don't care who you are. When it becomes unbearable, you're going to fight. You're going to fight. Unfortunately, because of that, this is what we have in Attica. And today, I'm not going to go any further, but I want you to know that we are all Attica, and there's many Atticas to come. One of the um, investigatory bodies that, uh, that Heather mentioned was the McKay Commission, which was a commission of citizens, uh, which uh, conducted an investigation. It was an interesting mix of, of, of people. Um, Bob Carter, who was uh, uh, Lee Dorian Brown, mm -hmm. uh, judge, a former, former inmate, and the, and the McKay Commission, in its report, it said, Attica is no better or worse than other magazines. Maybe Jose and Martha, um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not excluding Dale from that, from that edict. Um, maybe um, you can give us some sense of other facilities and the kinds of problems that you've experienced that resulted in the. Um, uh, in, in that. I've languished in. Prisons not only across the state of New York, but across the federal system, across the country for 38 straight years. And there is no prison like Attica. Attica is unique in that when I got there, that first generation of correction officers, their sons were working there. And it's like, from infancy, there was something etched in their hearts. And they carry it with them every second of the day. Never again. And they reminded you of them two words, never again. They exercise indiscriminate terror without any kind of accountability. When I first got there, they put me on a wall. They separated me from 40 men who were marching in the, going to the mess hall. Never again means that there will never be more than 40 incarcerated men marching, going anywhere at any one time. Never again means that when they put you on the wall, they tell you, if you take your eyes off the wall, we'll take that as an act of aggression. If you don't obey a command, we'll take that as an act of aggression. And then they will sexually assault you, dehumanize you, in ways that are so offensive that to me, I had to make some type of resist, so I made, I said something, it's all I can do. So they denied me, chow. The next time I came out, I came out with two knives on me. That's the response that they got from me. And I was begging, put me on the wall again because I will murder as many of them as I can. 
that's what they make you do. That's what they make you think. Fortunately, I wouldn't put it on the wall again. But that culture of terror is so real, and they don't let you forget. And why it matters for us today is because that culture of terror has been transformed into something that's even more devastating. Because today, that culture of terror is death by incarceration. Today, the state actually sentences men to death by incarceration. And this is worse than a physical beating. I could have been one of those persons that died in prison. Instead, I was released 20 months ago. And I will not walk the streets of New York or any other city as if the men I left behind did not exist. And that's why I'm here today, to remind everyone that not adequate does not only matter, but it is a memorial of men who, in a split second, decided I've had enough and put everything on the line. And I can't do any less. Thank you. This is working now. Um, I just want to pick up on a few things that have already been said first. Uh, Bill, if that's OK, um, just taking off on, on what Jose said. And uh, many of you may have read that currently 20% of the people who are serving life sentences are from Brooklyn, where we are right now. So I think it's uh, important to recognize that. So 20% of the people in our state serving life sentences or death sentences um, are from Brooklyn. Um, I want to also recognize um, what you said, Jose, that Attica is different. Um, and probably, as I was talking with someone else earlier, each institution has unique uh, parts of it. But there's also a lot of consistency across many of the prisons and jails in, in our country and certainly in, in our state. And I just want to lift that point up a little bit by thinking about our federal Department of Justice, uh, which oftentimes is defending our rights, or supposed to be defending our rights, and, and they conduct investigations into jails and prisons. They've done that for decades. Even under this president, this attorney general, right now they're active in 106 prisons and jails around the country. Across 17 states, the Department of Justice, this Department of Justice is active. And if you look at the Department of Justice investigations since Attica, if you look at a 10-year period, which some researchers have done, if you look at the findings from their investigations, you see in every one of their letters, and I'm speaking about jails right now, every one of their letters about jails includes a finding that these institutions failed to provide for the, to meet the basic needs of the people incarcerated there. And one other thing each of these letters finds. There's other things they find that are different among these institutions, but one other thing that they always find in their jail investigations is a failure to deliver health care properly and adequately. Um, so I guess one more thing I'll, I'll say, which is important about our New York City context and the Department of Justice, which is very active in, in our city now in, at, at Rikers Island and in the city's jail. So we have a federal consent decree in New York City. Um, that consent decree has been active since 2015. It's intended to cure constitutional violations in the city's jails. And in particular, the, the consent decree is trying to end the use of unnecessary and excessive force 
by staff against people who are incarcerated in the city's jails. And this consent decree, at, and I'll end here, has been active for three years. In the most recent report, three years into the consent decree, the federal monitor has told us that use of force levels have never been as high as they are now. Um, and, and the federal monitor's reports have documented how the, and this uh, goes back to some of the points raised today by all of you, how the excessive and unnecessary use of force that we see inside the city's jails is often precipitated by the behavior and by the actions of staff. Um, and so I, I just wanted to, to lift those points up about some of the things that have happened uh, since. Sorry, I hope that answered your question, Bill. Just on, on that point, I just wanted to add, again, at wearing my historian hat, I, I think sometimes when we are in this moment, which is so horrific, as Jose rightly reminds us, I mean, I, forget just New York, right? Alabama, the whole what's happening there right now, South Carolina, New York, Nevada, it doesn't matter. What we forget is how historically out of touch and weird this moment is. You know, throughout all of American history, the incarceration rate remained relatively the same, literally throughout American history. And what this path that we are now on, that really starts in 1972, is such a weird moment in history. It's a weird moment internationally. It's a horrific moment. And one of the reasons why that is allowed to happen is because of not telling stories from the inside and not listening to people on the inside. And one of the reasons why Attica was able to happen, that is to call attention to the bad conditions, was because the 60s had happened and because people were out there talking about the importance of decarceration and the importance of human rights and the importance of racism and the importance of civil rights. And the reason Attica now is just as horrific in all of the ways you just described is because those voices have been shut down so much. So I really really love this moment we're in because that's that is the one thing that is changing right people are coming home people are returning home and they're talking and they're telling and they are making clear what the costs of this this historic turn have been um, and and hopefully this will be one of those blips on the graph right historically and we undo this uh, as every other country has managed to do something differently before we move to talking about uh, the present and what is in the Jewish amount of that, let's open this up. Uh, what do you want? Um, hey, so I got happened on the same day of the Stoner Rebellion, and I'm wondering, as um, you spoke to if any of the retaliation that took place decades after trickled down from the top as it did with the Soro Rebellion in the 1700s. Thank you. Okay. You want to get more than one or more than one question or no? Oh, go right ahead. I, I, could you repeat that question again? Okay. So the Stono Rebellion took place on the same day as Attica, um, and that was a rebellion of enslaved peoples in South Carolina. And the slave owner responded violently to send a message to those enslaved. And uh, both of you basically spoke to the retaliation mm -hmm. by guard and employees thereafter and the decade after. I'm wondering if you feel that was planned by higher ranking administration officials. Oh no, but in the Stenner Rebellion, you know, we, they call that um, uh, Black August, you know, and it seems that in history, during the time of August, rebellion um, on slave revolts occurred. And the same thing happened now, as you can see, um, in modern society. Summertime come, particularly August, you see a heightened awareness of violence, of rebellion, of oppression, we just seen in August, uh, I think, believe we had two mass um, shootings. This is not aberrations. In history, in August, it seems that all the time, 
it is the time of heat, hostilities, and rebellion. I, I don't think the higher ups had anything to do with that, particularly in Attica. This is not what you call orchestrated um, mayhem. No, in Attica and in prison, these conditions are manufactured by the staff that work there and the higher ups. So it's not orchestrated. It's just that it's a cultural behavior. We're in rural America. And when I went upstate, that was farmland. And halfway through my time, I started seeing cities being built. From farmland to Costco's. You see? So you got a chance to see the dynamics economically, how society had changed while we were inside, and how the rural areas now became more progressive and um, urbanized. But the mindset never changed. Today in Attica, um, I couldn't go and stay in the town of Attica really at a hotel today. I got to go to the next town over, Patavia, because it's an interracial town. You understand? We're in the 21st century. They still living in the antebellum period. You know, so you know, understand something. It's a cultural, it's a cultural shift that must happen, but it's some serious work. Because if 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 I'm in a rural area, isolated from the rest of the world, I'm gonna have a narrow view of the world. And unfortunately, that's the case in areas like Attica, Clinton, Danamora. Comstock, New York. And these facilities look like castles. They look like an era that doesn't supposed to be here in the 21st century. Auburn is almost over 200 years old. They got asbestos in there. They still house people in there. This is a, this is a facility that should be a museum and shut down, but they still house people there. So we have to really understand, you know, like, there's no modernization with prisons. And truthfully, I'm not a reformist. Seriously, I'm an abolitionist. Because what we see has to be destroyed. And when we talk about a system that's you know, um, not working, it's working. Because it was designed to do what it's doing. And if we're honest about that, then we'll take that and say, OK, it's doing what it's doing. Now we need to do something to replace it. You know, re-imaging how this system will be. And it's really, I hate to put it on you, it's really up to the onus of the young people. Because this future, unfortunately, we hand you a, a bad bag. <laughs> and, but it's your future to change this bad bag and make it work. So please forgive me for being a part of that past. But I'm trying to encourage you today to really reimagine how this world will look and this society will look, not only without prisons, but with that money being reinvested into communities that need it. Let's be blunt, I'll, and I'll use my prerogative to, to say that racism permeates every aspect of American life, and it permeates American prisons. Uh, if, if you choose to um, follow Hamas and to address it. Well, mass incarceration was a racist agenda that was launched against the black and brown community. And, and, and I think that I wasn't in Attica during the rebellion. I have two of my co-defendants who were wounded during the takeover. They were also indicted, and they were also part of the settlement that resulted from the brutalities that occurred in Attica. But I was involved with the liberation movement because we recognized early that our communities were under attack. In 1971, so many things happened in that year that it, it, you know some of us weren't alive then, and some of us that were kind of overlooked it because Africa overshadowed a lot of the things that were happening. The New York Times, and I, I'm just quoting what they said. They said, up until that period, the police officers murdered 192 young men, young black men. 
New York City police officers murdered 192. That's almost incomprehensible that they did this and nobody knows about it. But what we hear about is when somebody gave them the justice. Then that becomes sensational news. Then the persons that they accuse of that are the savages. So they declare war on our communities long before Attica. And Attica, the, the men in Attica that were in Cosby and Attica were connecting to this, to this movement that was going on not only throughout the, the states, but all over the country. They were connecting. That's, that's you know, I, I believe that men become willing to sacrifice their lives when they have a greater cause. And, and what they're fighting against is so evil that you know that lives have to be sacrificed. And that evil is racism. It is brutal, it's so inhumane that there is nothing that racism won't do to achieve its goals. No boundaries whatsoever. And, and I think that men that were incarcerated during that period came to that realization that we're fighting an evil that is an extension of of that period where human beings were enslaved with such inhumane brutality that it, 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 it can't, it, it just, there's no law to stop it. Only people can stop this. And, and I, I, I concur with Muhammad, you know, we, we did what we can. You know, those of us, you know, I'm 68 years old, we did what we can. A lot of us did what we can. Uh, whatever more we can do, we, we're going to keep trying. But unfortunately, the onus to stop this, this racist wave that has been resurrected with this president that we have is, 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 is on the young folks before us. We have a question. And while we're getting to that, Heather, just, just for historical context, um, just tell us what the what the men articulated. You know what they what were the conditions that they were they were decrying. Well, the the root of the conditions, as both Terrell and Jose said, I mean it's racism. I mean the conditions manifested themselves in not enough food and abuse and too much time behind bars and not enough time in fresh air and too many beat downs. I mean, that's the way it manifested itself, but the actual conditions are, as you say, I mean, what was at stake was to be treated as equal, to be treated as human beings. And, and that's, you know, the question earlier about, was this coming from on high? Well, I mean, no, it, people on the ground did what they did in the moment, but let's be clear when Richard Nixon heard what had happened, he had one question and he said, was this a black business? And when he heard, which of course it was a multiracial business, right? There was a lot of men in the yard, but what he wanted to know is that would make it okay, right? Because if it was a black business and all those men had been shot dead and tortured, then that would have made it okay. And after Attica, because of all that kind of resistance, what happens? Well, politicians pass the Prison Litigation Reform Act to make it impossible, almost impossible, for prisoners to ever sue for what was happening to them behind bars. So what's at stake? I mean, everyone was real clear what was at stake. The people on high were real clear what was at stake. And Attica was that line in the sand in a lot of ways, right? Because the men inside were mobilized. And, and to shut it down, I mean, Rockefeller knew what it meant to shut it down. Nixon knew what it meant to shut it down. But the problem is you can't shut down human beings. You can't shut down what they thought they could shut down. And that's why we're, you know, that's why this conversation is still alive and we're still here, but make no mistake about it. They tried to shut it down. And, and just one other thing I want to say about that, which is, you know, this is not the first time that this was, that prisons were the policy response to black claims on freedom. 
right after the Civil War, you have four million newly freed people who wanted jobs, equality, housing, respect, dignity, humanity. And the response across the US South was to change the laws, to make things illegal that had not been illegal before, to make things that were illegal more illegal. And you look at a state like Georgia after the Civil War, the prisons are 100% white. And within 20 years, the prisons are 100% black. And that's not because white folks stop committing crimes and black folks lose their minds. It is because of a policy choice. And by doing that, by criminalizing people, people lose sympathy for those people. You can put those people to work for free. You can do whatever the hell you want to people once you've decided that they're a criminal. And so this is not the first time we've done this, and it's not the first time that incarceration has been the response to the black freedom struggle. And if we remember that, then we're real clear on what was going on at Attica. Good evening. I'll preface it by saying, first and foremost, my name is Tyrone Watkins. I was in Attica. Yes, you were. Um, but, you know, to get the hoop law of 48 years ago, because I progressed. Let me say this. I was born in 1948. I was raised in East New York, Brooklyn. Um, I went to school with a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Italian people. I learned about the camps from some of my educators in 182 and junior high school 149. This too shall pass, but it will never happen again. Yeah. Camp fit with all that kind of stuff? Yeah. What I'm preferencing is this here. I don't really relive Attica. I step away from it. I step away from it because I'm a survivor of it. Mm -hmm. And I choose not to live back in 1971. I choose to go on with upward and be progressive. But when I see things happen in this country like Charlottesville, and we just get a little blah, blah, blah from the newspaper, I think the state of Israel should have rebelled then. I say the state of Israel should have rebelled then. What did Charlottesville reference? What did it refer to? Not necessarily Attica. It was a coming out of a situation in a camp in this country that we refuse to address. We can talk about how the idiot Donald is. We can talk about and make joke of that all day. But let's talk about Charlottesville when blood and soil was the cry. Some of us remember 1938 in, in, in Germany. Do we? Or did we forget? Because Attica 71 was just a residue of that. When you talk of, I was educated by people that had the numbers on their hand. That's the age category I come from. And when I see as history goes, it always revolves again. Today, Tyrone Watkins, and I'm not promoting me, I'm promoting some of us. Me and I'm promoting the progress we make. I work for the Kings County District Attorney's Office, the same office that gave me or referred to me to get 25 years of my natural life in 1970, and I did 29. But I told myself and my peers told each other while inside. We're going to stop our past from being our future of the next generation coming. We you know what's happening in Attica today. Let's don't be dumbfounded to say that these things are not happening. We did not riot for toilet paper. We did not riot for a phone call. We want the humanity of America to change, if you really want to know the real deal. A lot of that is shut away from, 
talk as a sorry, you were you didn't talk to some of the people who I wanted you to talk to. Because you would have found out that Attica did not start in September of 1971. It started in Auburn. That's in there. <laughs> That's in there. No, what I'm saying, the progression yeah. of yeah. events that made it happen. Totally. Yes, George Jackson being murdered in, 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 in California was part of it. His brother being murdered was being was part of it. The brother being beat up in 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 in, in, in uh, Attica Box mm. that Thursday night was part of it. But this was just, these were things that just happened because, let me say this to some of you who don't know. Times Square had gates about this thick. True. The young guys that was there like me, we didn't bust those gates open. It was the old cons. It was the convicts. They had it swelled up in their body long enough. We just pushed it. They broke those gates down so we could get to all four blocks. A lot of people won't tell you that. It was the old guy. It was the big blacks and his crew. L.D. Bartley just sang, If We Must Die. But it was the old guy. The fact of the matter in 2019, and, and, and I have to be self critical. Self critical because we have advocates on Marcy Avenue, on Bainbridge Street, in the pink house, totally with neck. I can go back to 71 and play the violin and cry and all that, but I refuse to do so. I say we should take progressive steps to change this archaic shit that's happening right now in America. I had the fortune, and my sorry for going off. Okay. I had the fortune to go to Aruba this past summer on a vacation. And when I got to Aruba in a larger stand, people asked me, what's going on in your country? <laughs> no, these are not the intellects. These are the normal people. People who, who like, you know, do the cleaning and all. What's happening in America? And there's nothing we can say. But that's all part of that. All, and that, that, was, that was part of the depression. Yep, yep. Well, thank you. So let's, um, let's um, follow or leave this one. Yes. Uh, um, and talk just about a bit about uh, what if anything positive came out of that. If anything came out. Uh, I know Martha, you uh, uh, one of the key outcomes. One of the key outcomes was the grievance process. Can you talk about that? Hi, can you hear me? Um, yes. Thank you for asking. I'm very uh, I will keep this very brief because I want to hear from everybody else, but uh, I'm very passionate about grievance systems and I hope to convince all of you to also be passionate about them. Um, grievance systems were a hard won fight coming out of the protests inside of prisons in the 1970s. Um, that's one of the reasons we should care about them. Um, another reason we should care about grievance systems, which are in all of our 50 states and all of the prison systems and in most large jail systems is because uh, for instance, in New York State, the, mo the most recent public data I could find in New York State suggested that there were 32,000 grievances um, back in 2013. And each of those grievances uh, represents a unique concern, um, a unique concern of an incarcerated person, often a high stakes concern, uh, sometimes a life or death matter. Um, the grievance process, as uh, Heather was also mentioning, uh, alluding to, but the grievance process is the gatekeeper to someone who is incarcerated to, for them to actually defend any of their rights, for them to get outside, to get any assistance outside of the prison, they have to go through the grievance system. Um, so 
uh, it's, it's very important. And, and the last reason it's really important today for all of us to try to improve these systems is because many of them are broken. Um, and a consistent thing you will hear uh, going across institutions from people who are seeking to use the grievance system to have basic needs met um, is that the, the systems are overly burdensome, they're confusing, they have too many forms, they have too many rules, and in fact, they just end up obstructing people from actually accessing the courts. Um, and so for that reason, because they are uh, now broken, having been a hard-won fight uh, some decades ago, I think it's really important for us to turn our attention and uh, for the Correctional Association and other oversight agencies to shine a light on grievance systems. Ideally, I believe all grievances should be public, and importantly, the institution's responses to grievances should be public. Um, de-identified information, of course, uh, and unless a grievant objects to sharing their grievance. But really, I think that's the only way to hold uh, that system accountable. Did, Bill, did you want to ask a different question? Yes. Um, that, that's, that system was very important. Um, to For layman's term, it, it, it's a system to where you can complain about whatever atrocity or problems you're having. And the facility level, at that particular time when it was working, you had people like Todd Larkins and other people that was incarcerated who were what they call grievance representatives. So actually, it got to the point where the men inside was representing other men with their problems, doing investigations, sitting on hearings, and rendering decisions. And when it was that way, it worked. But you know, the Department of Corrections in New York State they know how to compromise something that works. <laughs> Believe that. So it don't work now. Matter of fact, if you file a grievance today, you might get killed. Because retaliation is real. I get letters every day. I'm afraid to file a grievance, Muhammad. I don't want to get it retaliated against. So that's the mantra. So it's important, but it's compromised now. What we really must understand is this. If you take that away and compromise that, you're going to recreate the circumstances and situations all over again. That means that this mechanism is falling on deaf ears. And that will happen in 71. The cries were falling on deaf ears. So we're back to that time period again. We already know what happens. And why would the Department of Correction go back to that type of time period or that circumstance and situations? Because they're complicit in this, really. They're very complicit. They, you know, people have to appeal to Albany, to their office. They know, they know, they see what's coming through. They're seeing people being denied medical attention. They're seeing people, uh, um, time computations mixed up, and they're doing more time than they should, and we sent this to. They see that. They see people saying they're not getting mental health services, and they need it. But they do not intervene. They sit up there and send a letter back saying that the allegations have no merit. And that's it. No more explanation. And I didn't know what merit was at that time. So I was real ignorant. So I'm like, what are they talking about? No merit. You know, see, this, is, this, is, this is sad. Because you can get, I can bring 100 men in here who file a grievance and they all, their response is the same. The grievances are different. Their complaints are different, but the response is the same. There's no merit to your allegation. Nobody's reading this. You know they got a rubber stamp. Because it's humanly impossible for the response to be the same all the time. Here's the deal. We have a prison system that is the most expensive in the world, and we all pay for it, and our families are inside of it, but we don't have any access to it. And what the men in Attica, the first thing they did when y'all went to D-Yard was bring the media in. Shine light on what goes on inside. Because the reason why that is able to happen is because nobody knows about it, nobody sees it, and the people who do see and do know rubber stamp and if it weren't for Osborne and Correctional and all of these other organizations going on, we really wouldn't see it. But 
the fact that we as a public fund an institution that is failing, that is broken, that breaks people, that destroys families, that destroys communities, and we just keep saying, you want more money? You want a bigger jail in Brooklyn? You want a bigger prison? You want more? Pr sure. I can't feed my family, but here's some more tax dollars for the prison system. That's crazy talk, right? So if there was any public accountability, then this couldn't happen. And that's the one legacy of Attica that was really important to remember. They understood that, right? You got to get eyes on what's happening in here. That's why the media was there. That's why there was all these speeches. That's why the first thing set up, right, was the, was the megaphone. That's why, because you had to finally tell people, this is what's really going on in here, that you think something, you think when you sentence somebody that they're going to go, they're going to get better, they're going to return home. No, this is what it really looks like, right? So it's about public accountability. And what is so interesting, the other legacy of Attica is that in 2016 and last year and all those other Augusts when there have been prison uprisings across this country, every one of them remembers Attica. And that says something about the importance of that moment when people stood up and said, look inside, this is what's really going on. And the truth is that the days of being able to say, when you got seven and a half million people under correctional control, and you got almost 100 million Americans with a criminal justice record right now, the days of being able to say, I don't know that, I, that's somebody else's problem, I don't know, uh, you know, that's not my story, that's just a lie. I mean, that, that is, you know, it, that means you aren't asking the right questions if you don't know what's going on, but it also means that someone's preventing you from seeing what's going on. And Attica says, open up those doors, right? This is what's going on. So, public accountability. Um, well, we don't have that. Uh, we do, we are getting cameras which is a form of accountability, uh, not to the public, but some indirect, so we can move in that direction. What other prescriptions um, are there for moving forward? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm with the release agent people in prison campaign, and, and I, I'm a believer that we have to decarcerate. We have to create opportunities for men to get out of prison for women to get out of prison. You know, when I was inside, I didn't really bother too much with the conditions. As long as I can get out. At some point in my life, as long as I can get out of prison, I, I can handle whatever comes my way. And, and most of the men that I know think that way. We want to we wanna return to our families. We want to be able to hold our grandchildren that we never had in our arms. So, you know, that's why I'm a part of this movement that rap leads, to try to create opportunities for the men and women to return back to their families, to their home communities, because I know from my own experience that these men and women have transformed their lives. They're honorable people. They're people who will be an asset to their communities. So the, the one thing that we all can do is hold our legislators accountable for making these laws that kept people in prison for 40 years that caused so many deaths. A thousand people died in New York State under Cuomo's governorship. And if we allow that to continue, then we are complicit in this. And I don't think anybody wants to be uh, collaborating with our own oppression. So we have an opportunity now to hold the people in office accountable. We have to make demands. We have to organize and make demands that they create opportunities so that more men and women will not die in prison like Valerie Gator, a 61-year-old woman, the longest serving woman in New York State prison, died 
because Como did not give her clemency to commute her sentence, and because our legislators failed to pass a bill that would have set her free. And I think we have to we have to recognize that we have that opportunity to 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 make these laws, and, and we should take advantage of this opportunity. I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge someone that's here. Um, this is a person that we, um, with the candlelight visuals to get her out, protests in Cuomo office to get her out. It was a long fight. And for her to be here today, you know, I, I have to stop to just thank her and honor her. Uh, Judith, please stand up. This is Judith Clark. Thank you, thank you. Um, Miss, Miss Clark, uh, co-defendants are my friends. They, as a young man, they were professors to me. Really, as a young man, these, these men were professors. And uh, Ty Larkin, you know, I used to sometimes follow behind him in Green Haven because he wore so many hats. He was the prison politician. So to see him here tonight really is an honor because, you know, uh, I don't expect him to come hear me speak. I expect to go hear him speak. So I thank you, brother, for being here today. And he was an adequate, you know. And, and, and that's just to give an indication to everyone here that you've seen people who might have made a mistake in their life here today not only change people, but committed people. And they transfer other lives today out here. And that's why rap campaign is important. But I want you to understand that we have small gains, small wins, particularly in Attica. You know, the brutality that we talked about that exists, and it still exists, but it's somewhat subsided. Because you got cameras in there. You got over 500 cameras up in there. So the brutality complaints has dropped dramatically. But the complaints about you disrespecting my visitor, you stealing my food package, your Turning off the power in my cell, I don't have no lights. You turn off the water. You, it's called burning me for child. And this is the language. And these are new type of torture tactics. These are torture tactics that's coming out of the military because people are being waterboard now. See, this is not uh, of that first generation. The first generation just knew brutality from a physical standpoint. Now we have the offsprings who went into the military and they're bringing military torture tactics inside. So you see the death rate now climbing because they know how to kill, you see? So like I said, we got cameras, but things have become more sophisticated and shifted. And that's how the Department of Corrections is today. Please understand, when you get a small win, it's only for a moment because they know how to pivot real well. They've been doing this a while. So like my brother said, he's 68. He's an old man. Old men fighting this fight. I'm 59. I'm young to them. But we fight in this fight because we understand that this fight is a fight for our lives. And what we're really fighting is not mass incarceration. We're fighting the existence of it through the 13th Amendment, the approval of it. When a country and a government can approve of slavery and make it a foundational law, we have to fight against that. We have to. Because if we don't, they have a law that will put us in slavery. Thank you, Stephen. And then we're going to move on. I don't know what section you did. But um, just part of the legacy, they talk about the children of the murdering guards. Mm. The men had children. The men came from a woman. Each man came from a woman. What was that woman thinking during those four days? What were the children thinking? What were their relatives thinking? And I know all the many times I've taken the prison bus all those long nights riding up to Attica thinking and wondering and all of that. And so the missions I mentioned too often in the mass incarceration struggle is who these men are connected to. They are, you know, alone like that. 
So say, well, okay, if you have family outside, why can't the family people do something? That's a complicated thing. The family say, well, no, because something might happen to him. So we go around and around. But the point I want to make is that must always remember that somebody gave birth to that person. And so a decade or two decades later, Grandma, what, where's my grandfather? Well, he was killed in Africa. What's that? You know, what? How? What? And so there's a psychological legacy of psychic trauma that continues and continues. Of course, it didn't start with Attica. No, it goes way back. You know, the black codes, the anti lynching laws, all of those things. There's a trajectory, and we're just continuing on that trajectory. But as we continue, I don't want us to forget the women, the women, the women.
classroom, there are no free space left in that prison where people can talk. Zero. I mean, maybe some of the yards, but getting to the yard, into the yards now, it's like, you, you, it's such a brutal process to get into the yard that no one goes there that's going to do a meeting. So this period now, I feel like, is an intense period of regression. And I think it's because and it's coming from Albany, it's not coming from you know specific wardens. And I'm sure if that's happening at Bedford, it's happening in the in the snow of the doing. So I feel like it's a critical period. And I think there is a connection between what you were saying, Jose, about the incarceration and the conditions. Because I think if we're talking about letting people out, then you have to stop that process when they go in. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. We only have to start with the yes, yes, yes. Not yes. 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 And so you have to work with people. I mean, the, the generation that came out of the 80s in Bedford, when they came out, which most of them did, they were able to reenter the community because they had gone through a process that they could reinvent themselves. The, the sisters that are there now, they're just saying hi because there's nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. They just, they, you know, and then, the, and then they do more repression. So I think it's a very bad period that has to be addressed. Uh, I just want to um, thank you for your comment and um, for highlighting the, the cyclical nature of, of repression and control inside of these institutions um, and for, uh, for telling us about the uh, pushback and the elimination of these programs. It's um, a shame that people have to learn of that kind of thing here. Um, uh, and you know we've been talking about accountability, and um, there's accountability, and there's accountability, and then there's some other level of accountability we have no I, we, that we need that we don't even know could possibly exist in these institutions. And I just, you know, um, speaking to the cameras, which has positive and negative impacts um, that have been highlighted here, I just want to lift up the the Board of Corrections work in, in New York City a little bit when it comes to accountability and what that really means. So the board is an independent agency. It actually looks at, it has access to all of the cameras and to the video. Um, and that's really important. Um, it's something that independent oversight agencies like the Correctional Association should have. Um, just one example of why that's really important. In, um, Recently, the board audited what are called unannounced rounds that are conducted in the jails at unpredictable times. And it's very basic, right? You walk around, the staff walks around to check on people, to check on places. The goal in, in this case, we were, we were looking at uh, tours to prevent sexual violence and sexual abuse. And, and we found that they were documented. And then we looked at the cameras. And 40% of the time, those tours, those checks were not occurring as they had been documented on paper. Um, and so it's just, a, just one more example of um, you know, something being what's told and, and that needing to being checked, it needs to be checked in these institutions. And, and obviously um, unannounced rounds or checks, it comes up all the time. You should be thinking about it because of Jeffrey Epstein. He wasn't checked on. It comes up in every death investigation inside of these institutions. So um, I just wanted to raise that point. Thank you, and thank everybody for your comments. So what is other than putting cameras in, uh, what is being done, or what do you think can be done about the behavior of the prison staff? I, I mean, I have, you know, that's just something that hasn't come up. What, what, who, who, we have law, we, we, I've heard we have laws, but we, the laws don't, don't matter. So in the case of the prison staff, how, does anyone have any thoughts on whether anything can be done? I'm going to defer um, to my left in just one moment, but I do want to say that there's a lot of attention on individual staff and individual actions of staff, and there's no question that culture change at some fundamental level has to happen because the brutality is so 
so deep now. I mean, black guards, white guards, Latino guards, it, it guards, this position of power culturally needs a shift. But I want to stress that people don't do what they're not allowed to do. People don't get away with what they're not allowed to get away with. And so at the end of the day, the fact that that happens is because someone's letting it happen, meaning someone's not going to court, someone's not getting charged, someone's not getting fired, somebody's not getting censured, and cameras aren't on in that particular spot in the prison. Like, There's a whole pay grade above everybody who's on the inside that allows this to happen. And that goes to your point, Jose, about legislators, about laws, about about the ability to access the courts, about the ability to actually bring a suit, have criminal charges brought against uh, uh, someone who's uh, committed abuse in prison. I mean, this is this is, you know, this is a whole realm of which is so much above the actual staff and and we don't ever talk about that level of it. And I think that's kind of what we need to start thinking about. People only do what they can get away with doing, right? I read, when I was inside, I read, this was during the investigation of some brutality that happened in Attica. Uh, Acting Commissioner Anthony Anucci, he's quoted in the New York Times as saying that he knows that they might be hundreds of correction officers who are committing illegal acts, crimes. He said, but there's nothing he can do about it. He said the unions are too strong. He's the acting commissioner of the Department of Correction. There's nothing he can do about it. What the hell is he doing there then? <laughs> really? You know, and, and this is the problem. You know, it, it, it boils down to holding them accountable. You know, they're, 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 he should not be acting commissioner if there's nothing he can do about it. Right. And, and the governor, he has to be held accountable because he keeps him there. And, and, and the only people, and I, 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 you know, I just firmly believe this, that the only people who are gonna create real, meaningful, genuine change it's critical mass support. Us, the people. The people have to demand genuine reform, genuine changes. Because if, if we don't make our demands clearly heard, then you know, we're going to get what, what, what we're, we're getting right now. I, I have to concur with um, Jose. Um, I've, I've been home since 2005. And every battle that we've won or made progress was because of people, seriously. I don't care how many legislative laws that we come up with, the law could be implemented, but it wasn't passed because the people. And that's the only way we're gonna hold them accountable. And really, you know, I did a little what you call test run. We picked a facility um, last year and we had family members at Green Correctional Facility because there was a lot of deaths there. And the family members came up on a Saturday, didn't go visit their loved ones. They stood out in front of the prison to protest the brutality. The prison guards and the staff were so upset, they called the state troopers. And start, the state troopers started threatening the families, saying you don't have um, permission to you know, protest here. But that showed us something, even the families, that if we show up, people are going to pay attention. And that was just a trial run. Because people, see, families complain, but they complain individually. But if I put them all in a room and show them how many people complain, they see they ain't alone. They get a little more strong in their stance. Because they, at first, they believe they're alone. But when they see other people going through the same thing, and they can converse with one another and stand with one another, they become organized. And that's the mightiest voice we got, is the family. They're the strongest advocates for anybody that's incarcerated, is the families. So as families stand up, as what we call good citizens stand up, we can hold people accountable. But if we continue to bury our head in the sand and say, uh, that's those people, it doesn't affect me, I live in Westchester County, 
Well, they're arresting people in Westchester County, too. Matter of fact, um, Stop and Frisk had went from New York City upstate now. There's more 16, 17 year olds being arrested up there than in New York City. See, again, how they pivot. See, we make a f f small victory, stop, stop and frisk in New York City, and they find a way to pivot. So you understand, this is a lifelong fight. But we need the people. We need your voices. We need your commitment. And most of all, we need money. <laughs> most of all, because this fight is not free. <laughs> you know, this is a fight that costs. The state has awesome money. You know, awesome money, billions of dollars. You see, but we have people, and people power trumps anything. Twos and fuels, two dollars, three dollars, four dollars, five dollars. Believe when you're doing this way, it goes a long way. Pencils and pens. We travel to these facilities once a month. We have to stay in hotels. We have to get cars. And we stay there for three to two days sometimes, long days. Eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon. That's work. That's dedication. And do it in the summertime. You're going to be sweating like James Brown. <laughs> I'm telling you, family. So understand that the work that many of these men and women do, you know, it, it, it's untold. They can't even be recompensated for some of the sacrifice. So to be here, and y'all took time out of your lives tonight. So I want to thank you for doing that. Because guess what? Not too many people take times out of their life to hear about things concerning incarceration. This is not a good story. There's always a sad story. But it's a story that must be told. The community at large must know about this. The community at large must understand that we have to stop this. And this is the 20th century fight. Donald Trump is not a problem. Believe me, he's going to come and go. But this prison system has been standing for a long time through many presidents, and it hasn't stopped. So support us. Get on board. Humanities, Heritage, uh, Weeksville Heritage Center, and definitely the Correctional Association. Come on. You know, uh, we got a text number where you can um, <laughs> uh, donate and y'all can, you know, support us. You didn't put, no, she didn't put me up to this, but this is what I have to do. Because, I, hey, you, you know, really, we're a Mighty Mouse staff. We're a staff for five or six. And we represent, uh, uh, where Evan at? You hear that? That's what we represent. And five people represent that many people. One person got to take all those phone calls. That's work, people. But it's gratifying work. It's work that I'm honored to do because I'm in a unique position to do work that I always wanted to do. See, you don't get to, to live your passion all the time. So I'm, I'm getting to live my passion. Yes, yes. Support the CA. And support Brad. Hey, uh, we, you know, we, we are at rap. We're, you know, we're one, one family. You know, where uh, we got love, mad love for each other. That's that's why we all love the work we do. Um, and we're abolitionists, and that, you know, that's a word. That's, you know, that's a powerful word. We do not believe that human beings should be in prison. It, it doesn't matter what we call them, jails, correctional facilities, prisons, uh, how it camps, you know, because we were founded by formerly incarcerated people and we know what prison does. And we also can envision a different world without prisons. So as abolitionists, we don't believe that we should make laws that offer freedom 
to some people, and on the other hand, death to others. So we have no carve-outs. We don't exclude anybody. Everybody that's incarcerated in the state of New York, and I focus on the state of New York because that's our focus, every incarcerated human being in the state of New York is entitled to human justice without considering the crime of conviction or the length of sentence. All of them should be free of the opportunity to be free at some point in their lives. And that's what we fight for. And if that sounds to some sitting here like pie in the sky, like you can't imagine that, or what would it look like if there were no prisons? You gotta remember that there weren't always prisons that people handle crisis and social ill and trauma and hurt and harm in many, many different ways. And if you ever wonder how would it look like if you had a society where you did something differently than put someone away for 30 years, think about what people with a lot of money do. And someone in their family does something wrong. The last people they call are the police and the last thing that they want to have happen to their loved one is for them to go to jail. Why? Because they know it will make them less safe. They know that the collateral consequences on their family will be devastating, and they don't believe for a minute that it actually serves justice. So what they do is they try to figure out why did that person end up where they ended up. They try to get that person some measure of help. They try to do some measure of remedy some measure of restitution, some way to make it better. But nobody with resources and options and choices ever chooses prison. And so if you think about that, then all of a sudden words like abolition or doing it a different way don't seem crazy. They seem like that's what people do when they have choice. And the last thing I just want to say has to do with this thing about people, because we've said we've all said it in our way that it's going to take people to do this. And again, that's another one of those concepts. They're like, yeah, people, yeah, that's a, that's a big that's a big ass. Like, what does that even mean? Again, just visualize for a moment. If there are two point whatever it is now, three million people behind bars, imagine just just like a thought experiment, if every family could just send one person on the same day to Washington, D.C., just one, just one, just one, one out of all your family members. And that's not even including people who are not directly impacted. I'm just saying those people. Washington, D.C. wouldn't be able to function on that day. And what if everybody just wore a little sign that said, this is my person, this is my person inside. And we want eyes on these places, we want accountability. I mean, so that's what we mean, people. This is not crazy. It's not like, you know, well, what people? Well, just people, people who are impacted, but then hopefully everybody else too, because actually we're all impacted. Prisons don't make us all safer. They don't make us, they don't make sense financially for all of us, and they don't make anybody better. So 